Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all my blessed beloveds out there in video land. You're watching Living and Thriving with Rusty, and I'm Rusty, and I'm so excited. I am doing back-to-back -back interviews with amazing people from all over the world, and I get to share them with you. So, as you know, I love my doTERRA, and this is my latest. I've um, almost way through the bag you've got to try it it is so delicious um, if you're into protein shakes definitely get a sample before you buy the whole bag but it is worth it I love it and that's that but as far as the show goes I have very few pet peeves but one of them is name dropping one of them is disregarding process as you all know I do this by myself and it's a lot of work in the background and it costs quite a bit of money, but I do this because this is my passion and I love what I do and I love being able to bring you amazing people from all over the world to tell those story in an authentic way. Authenticity, uh, authentic, you know what I'm trying to say. I need my coffee. It is really where the show is at. And when you are a publicist and you're dropping your name and you're disregarding process and you're showing up at 8 30 9 o'clock at night wondering if your guest got their link you're not doing your job and your guest is paying you or my guest is paying you to publicize for them and to come back and be rude about it and disregarding my time and your guests money and time you're not going to be on the show anymore. Um, not to say that your guests won't be on the show, but you as, a, as an individual who is acting as a publicist, you're not doing your job and you're not coming from an authentic place. And, you know, I just don't, I don't have the time for it. And so that is a huge warning to a lot of people. As the show gets bigger, we've increased by 123%. It's huge, and thank you all for subscribing and liking and sharing and commenting. I'm grateful to that, but don't, don't, don't be um, disrespectful because you think that your name that you work for is going to carry more weight than being respectful to the person you are representing as well as the host of any show. Anyway. Off my soapbox, I am inviting Wendy to come on and she's gonna share her story as to who she is, what she does, and what makes her her. Um, but again, authenticity, that's what this show is all about, being real. And I'm so excited because I have 215 of you this season. So this season is going to December. And we're not doing one show a week anymore. We're doing two because my inbox is still jam-packed with individuals. So I'm super excited. And Wendy, you're there. Hi, good morning. Can't hear you, my love. <laughs> Una momento, she says. <laughs> How's that? Beautiful. Good morning, Miss Wendy. Hey, good you? morning. I'm great. How are you? I'm living the dream. I live in, in the tropics. And so we are having this a much needed rain. Um, and all of the gigantic dinosaurs that live around here are just really loving it and like wallowing in the mud puddles and stuff. Well, so, like real reptiles? Yeah, I'm in Southern Florida. Oh, Southern Florida. <laughs> the tropics. Yeah. The tropics. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's not fancy like St. Martin or St. Croix, but you know. We still have dinosaurs. Nice, you do, you do. Compared to up here, we don't have, I have a groundhog. That's the closest I get to a dinosaur up here. What state are you in? Massachusetts. Oh, I just came back from that area. I go up every summer for two weeks and hike in um, the White Mountains and the oh, Appalachian. Really? Yeah. And yeah. so I'm coming down from a 26 hour drive and 39 car accidents from Philly to Savannah. It's like Death Valley. I don't know if you just like the Grim Reaper hangs out there and he's like smoking a cigar going, okay, you're next. I don't know. It's just very, oh, the needs of hell. <laughs> yeah, that's awful. But it is nice to be out on the road sometimes. I do like road trips. I love it. I actually, I'm looking to build a schoolie. So 
I can take the show on the road and instead of doing this, you and I can actually sit and have it face to face, which is really exciting to me because during the whole Rona thing, I think people miss that contact. No question. No question. This is getting, it's nice. It's a nice way to connect if there's nothing else, but uh, I was just talking about that with somebody this morning. Like if we could have, you know, a group of people in person, it would just be so lovely after all this time. We, we will get there and life is this beautiful journey of ebbing and flowing and plot twists. Right. And Mm -hmm. so I think this time has allowed a lot of us to reset and reconnect to our priorities. Um, and for some people, it just made them start craving mad. Um, <laughs> but for most of us, we just sat back and were like, oh, my priorities, they were really screwed up. Now what? <laughs> like, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Because this was damn close. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing in a lot of ways. Um, so you, young lady, are something magical, as your sign says in the back, and you've written yeah. a book and you have all kinds of beautiful things to share with us today. So who are you, what do you do, and what makes you you? That's a lot. Um, So I'm Wendy Tamis Robbins. I am a full-time corporate attorney, have been for over 20 years, but at the same time while practicing, I have had a an anxiety, obsessive compulsive and panic disorder for over almost 40 years. So absolutely while I was practicing that was going on. Um, And it wasn't until about six years ago. So my anxiety disorder really started when I was six years old. And it was about six years ago when um, I started to ask myself and others around me, my psychiatrists, my coaches, my doctors, if somebody who had suffered for that long could ever really live a life free of, of those disorders. And they all sort of said, I don't know, or probably not, you know, you're managing just fine. You're highly functioning, you know, kind of like, why would you want more? But I could see this life on the other side of it that I just couldn't reach, you know, I couldn't get there. Um, And so I went on this journey to find out if that could be real for me. And that's where the book was born. Um, It's called The Box, An Invitation to Freedom from Anxiety. And it really chronicles my journey, like where I started and and what steps I took along the way to go on that healing journey. And, And now I consider myself anxiety free, not because I'm completely free of anxiety. You know, there's a normal amount of anxiety we all experience, um, but because it doesn't control my life anymore, like it had for almost four decades. So do you know what the trigger was when you were six or when you recognized that behavior? Was there abuse or some sort of... um... Yeah, so um, my house was very volatile at times. Um, There was a lot of chaos. My mom was very anxious. She, so I see this generational, um, you know, mental health issue where if it's not treated, if it's not, um, if those wounds aren't healed, you know, we unfortunately pass them on to our children because of the environment that we're creating, um, or we can pass them on, right? It depends on the child and how they're interpreting their surroundings. But for me, Absolutely. It was that chaotic environment that I grew up in, um, in that need to control everything in a very hypervigilant way. So um, I tell the story that the, the summer before I had my first panic attack, um, my parents got a new refrigerator and, you know, that big cardboard box that the refrigerator comes in, they put that in the living room for us to play in. And I was the only one that went in, but I really was hiding more than playing because I could hear people screaming and dishes breaking and things like that, like the chaos outside of those cardboard walls. And so when we moved the next summer, I sort of brought that box with me, not physically, but metaphorically, you know, and as my anxieties grew, so did the walls of that box. They just... And that's really what I created was a safe place. But over time, you know, you you think that all of these external factors are creating and triggering your anxiety, but in reality, you really have to go within, right? So no matter how high and thick those walls were, I really couldn't, I wasn't safe. I really had created a prison. 
because I wasn't living my life because I was so afraid of those anxious feelings and um, physical discomfort, all of the, you know, all of the symptoms that come along with it. Um, I was so trying to hide from them, but. Let's talk about trauma because this is something that I'm um, really gifted in, I suppose, <laughs> coming from a volatile childhood as well. Um, do you think, and this is always interesting to me because I know the answer and you know the answer, but our audience may not. Do you <laughs> think that the reason why you became a lawyer specifically and determined to be a lawyer was to fight the injustices that you recall as a child deeply? Absolutely. Yes, no question. Because I got attached to that idea very at a very young age. And um, it was specifically around learning about Abraham Lincoln. And when I saw that he was a savior, right? Like I can, when I attach certain words to it, they make such a, such sense to me on an emotional level, what the trauma that I was going through. And then when I found out he had bouts of depression, I was done. I was all in. I was like, this is my person, you know? I dated his great, great, great grandson, by the way. Get out of here. Totally. And Abraham Lincoln was my favorite. And it wasn't because of um, anything more than he really had shit storms in his life and he just persevered. You mm -hmm. know, his wife, first wife, I believe, killed herself and the second one died of cancer and, you know, just, right. wow. And he kept fighting yeah. and fighting and fighting for what he believed in. So you and right. I are both sisters that way, girl, shoot. Yeah, yeah. Love Mason Lincoln. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So I think it's interesting, especially when you've had a traumatic childhood, how we subconsciously or consciously put on a super cape and we go out trying to rescue the world. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that increased your anxiety about the world? Um, I, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I was always looking for... Um, you know, things that would cause me or other people harm. So there was that, that hypervigilant part of it. You know, I didn't think the adults were paying enough attention. You know, I could, I was identifying things at every turn. And that's really what my, my mind was hyper-focused on was finding threats, right? So triggering that fight or flight response just constantly. So absolutely. But I think in addition that's the external part of it. I think internally it created all of this pressure, you know, to perform and to be the savior and to, um, yeah. So it was coming from both internally and externally. I know with myself personally, with the fight or flight and the super cape and having to save the world and dun, 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 I ended up with a lot of health issues. I ended up in college because um, I was the first to graduate college. I was the first to graduate high school. There was a lot of that kind of pressure that I gave myself. It wasn't external at all. Mm -hmm. It was just how am I going to better my, my life? Seven ulcers in college. God. It was awful, awful. And severe anxiety attacks where I was hospitalized and just that kind of internal implosion on myself. Um, did you find that you ended up struggling with health? Yeah, it's funny, like for some of the people that read the book already, they come back to me saying they didn't realize how physically debilitating anxiety can be. And especially that um, mind gut connection, right? Like how strong that is and how the two of them can feed off of each other. So. I too had serious um, like intestinal issues um, in law school, especially I remember going to right outside of my office. I was working full time at the time as well at the Mass State House and my doctor was right across the street and I would go in almost daily every afternoon and he would just put the bottle of Mylanta right there on, on the chair and just say, just chug it and I'll be back in a half an hour, like on a daily basis, you know, and then I was a. Uh, I went to school, um, college on a track scholarship. So I had been an, a three sport all star athlete. I went Division one college athlete, and then to the point where the panic was so strong that I couldn't even run around the block. I could barely walk through, a, you know, a grocery store without holding onto the cart just to keep my balance. So to go from that kind of, you know, physical health to being completely debilitated like that. Um, and then other things got exacerbated, um, like 
ear, ringing in my ear, ear issues like that, just, you know, all of those autoimmune conditions that can be triggered. I have psoriasis as well, that of course the anxiety just worsens that and inflames it as well. So yeah, there's a lot of different, um, different connections there where it manifests physically as well. I had a um, house fire a number of years ago where the kitchen just literally exploded. I, it was Thanksgiving oh, God. and um, it was a horrible house fire and <laughs> for years and even to this day, and this was a bazillion years ago. I think my, my bonus child was eight at the time and she's now 27. So that gives you perspective. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Even to this day, before I leave the house, I have to tell myself the stove isn't on everything's unplugged and I have to walk myself through the house because as soon as I get in the car and it's about two miles down the road, I've noticed that I start getting anxious going, did I unplug the coffee maker? Is the stove on? Even though I hadn't cooked anything for two days, you know, mm -hmm. my meal pepper. Um, yeah. And it's really people, I think underestimate how difficult it can be for people who have anxiety issues. Um, because we really are, are two-faced in the sense that we are silently suffering with this anxiety while we're trying to smile and hold our external world together. And I can only imagine how difficult uh, that would be as someone who's practicing law. Because um, there's a lot of components and there's a lot of facades that you have to put on anyway, on top of trying to mask your own internal struggle. Talk to us a little bit about some of your coping mechanisms, because I know a lot of people would be interested in learning how they can step outside of their anxiety level. Yeah, so when I was coping through all of that, I don't think they were healthy coping mechanisms. You know, they were, I had lifelines, so I was calling my mother or calling my husband at the time um, on public transportation, you know, um, because I was having panic attacks the entire time I was on the train and um, holding clonopin in my hand throughout the day at the law firm, too anxious to take it because I had health anxiety as well. So my medication never really worked because I was too anxious to put it in my mouth and swallow it. But, um, and then just creating very small spaces, you know, walking to the office, never leaving, bringing the specific food that I could eat, um, taking my pulse all day long, taking the same elevator because I believed that that one would make me the least anxious, um, you know, taking it by myself, never getting in with other people, you know, little rituals like that, that I was just barely getting through the day just to like get to the next moment, the next meeting, avoiding meetings, avoiding lunches with people, things like that. Um, whereas, now, I mean, that's coming from a complete fear mindset, right? Because I was still just solely focused on the panic, the anxiety, um, and really just how to manage, how to white knuckle my way through the day. And as you say, just keep putting the masks on. And that is just so, I was exhausted by the time I got to work, never mind getting back home from work, which put a huge strain on my relationship and so forth. So, whereas now, after healing, um, that trauma and all of those things um, along the way, my, my mindset is just so different. So I'm starting at the beginning of the day with a clear intention, a, a meditation that I know works for me, um, a, a morning routine, uh, the way that I eat, the way that I fuel my body throughout the day. I mean, I was drinking caffeine. I was eating sugar, I was eating, um, you know, carbohydrates, things like that, where my blood sugar levels were going up and down throughout the day like crazy. And that, that roller coaster is a whole chapter in the book, like how all of that can have such a detrimental effect on your, on your mental health. Um, so, you know, now I don't, I'm not really coping anymore. I'm just, I've already put these mechanisms, these, um, these things, these strategies into my day that I'm functioning in a very different way. And my mindset is like a growth mindset versus fear. So there's a lot of questions I have for you, believe it or not. I don't normally ask this many, these many questions, but are you still with your husband? Um, no, I'm with a new one. Okay. That was, that was interesting <laughs> because you're a new person. So the new person has, you know, to adjust. 
All right. So that and answers- I'm a stepmom. I just want to mention that because you're you said you have a bonus child. So you're a yeah. stepmom. So I'm, a, another- I'm a bonus mom on top of a biological single mom. And it's beautiful to watch my kids. I can't imagine life without them. I wanted like 50,000 of them, like a <laughs> class or something, but with anxiety and all the health issues that I ended up having, um, that just wasn't in the cards for me. Yeah. So I, I love the fact that you brought up eating. One thing that people don't necessarily correlate with their anxiety or their lifestyle is that insulin makes you topsy-turvy, ooh, you know, everywhere. And it actually is an emotional trigger. So when you're high, you're high. And when you're low, you're low. And when you're in between, you're emotional, right? Mm -hmm. And what kind of, are you doing paleo? Are you doing keto? Because once you get out of that emotional high, low extreme of the sugars and carbs, you balance. And I think that also helps you reduce your levels of anxiety because you're not in this emotional space. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like homeostasis is, is really important, you know? So, um, how do I eat? Um, I don't really label it, but I eat vegetables and fish and plant-based, you know, protein bars and a few fruits here and there. And that's really about it. Are you still running? Um, no, I stopped running. I, but I currently I'm on crutches from tennis. (laughs) I just got a new ACL, but (laughs) so I'm not going to be running anytime soon. But, um, so I started doing a lot of yoga, like really hardcore hot yoga during my journey because my mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer stage four, um, at the beginning of me starting this, this, journey and I was spinning at the time, which I am, I'm still a spinner. I have my, um, my Peloton, which I adore. Um, but I couldn't really hyperventilate and cry on a Peloton, you know, while spinning, it was not, it was not working. So I went back to the mat and I had never really been able to do yoga because I would have a panic attack and I would leave class and I would feel ashamed in the car. And it was just this cycle that I was like done with, but I knew that it was a place that I was going to need to take. It was like the next step on my journey that I could, I could feel the pain body. I'm sure you've experienced that. I knew I had so much anxiety and pain built up in my body that I needed a space just to release it. And so I got back to the mat and that was really a cathartic place to um, process just years and years of emotion, as well as the new emotion around, um, uh, healing the relationship with my mother, um, you know, and really just finding so much forgiveness and connection with her before she passed. So, um, yoga became a huge part of my life during that time. And so between the, you know, walking, I live by the ocean, getting outside and walking and doing the yoga and the spinning and a ton of tennis, and then, you know, hiking up in the mountains in Vermont and Skiing in the winter. I love cross country skiing. Um, that's one of my favorites. That's pretty much the regimen. I I tried. I'm originally from Florida, and I attended college in Vermont. And I tried cross country skiing, and it was more of rusty, flat on her ass, going, "Get me the hell out of here! I want." Florida. <laughs> That was my first experience too. Yeah, I was like, thought I was so athletic and I stood there and I just fell right over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, weeble wobbles do fall down and they don't get back up in the snow. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I do appreciate the hiking. I love Camel's Hump in Vermont. That was one of my favorite oh, yeah. places. It's nice and challenging and the view, it, you know, I'm very spiritual and um, I always feel like I'm a bird when I'm up there, mm-hmm. like you get to see the entirety of everything. And it just means so much. And yet you realize how small you are when you're on top, yeah. right? Yeah, so, it's so beautiful. So I have right. done it, yeah. And I love revisiting those in meditation. You know, it's something that may only happen once, but you can recount that and find like that beauty and that, that spiritual connection again, if you just recreate it in your imagination. Absolutely. So what do you do for a living now? For a living? I'm still a full-time lawyer. 
Um, so I'm at, yeah, Holland and Knight, a big international law firm. Um, but my practice is creating um, affordable housing and doing social impact lending. So it's really rewarding. And then um, I'm also speaking uh, around the book. I do um, a program called Recognize, Reduce, and Refocus Your Anxiety. Um, I do it for law firms and professional associations and colleges, um, which as we know is a very, um, college kids right now, their anxiety, you know, is through the roof. It's especially during COVID. Um, it's increased like 35%. It's crazy. But um, so speaking and, you know, the book is doing great. So I'm planning on a few others um, just to kind of be more um, like practical handbooks that go along with it, like talking about things that we're talking about, diet, exercise, things like that to help reduce anxiety. Um, and then I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching just because it's kind of been a natural evolution where people just want more, more time with me to go through the program, you know, that kind of gets laid out in the book. What is the most exciting part of, about your journey? What has been the moment where you just cry and you're like, oh my, I did it. It's really when I step out of my comfort zone in a way that I just never thought I could because I could see it for so long. You know, I could see the life that was waiting for me on the outside of those, the walls of that proverbial box and just cried, you know, for so many years would just sit there and cry, just believing I would never do it. So when I do things like a hike by myself or skiing a black diamond, which I don't do very often, but have, <laughs> or um, sailing, you know, we have a sailboat. Every time I go out, like every time I do those things, I have such an, a palatable appreciation for it because I never thought it would happen. So it's, it is like a spiritual practice in that sense. I feel like, like you said, I feel like I'm flying. I feel like I just, yeah, it's really amazing. Like you just feel unstoppable. You know, when you were um, trying to heal some of the trauma between you and your mom before she passed, uh, what was your big takeaway from that? Like, what did you realize that you didn't see before about your mom? Um, I realized that she was doing the best with what she had at the time in terms of skills, emotional skills that the trauma that she had endured in her past that had been left unhealed was far greater than anything I had experienced. So I had this sense of a new sense of compassion for that, you know, versus being a victim, you know, you feel victimized as you bear that burden. And I, that really released a lot of that for me when I could see the cycle that had progressed throughout those generations. Um, and then I also felt like I wanted an apology for so long. And I really did, that kind of falls away when you start to just have a better understanding and a more compassionate outlook for that person. I didn't need to reopen those wounds, you know, they were there, but I was healing them on my own without needing her to say she was sorry, which I think relieved a lot of pressure for both of us. And then as she got more, um, more sick, I really just saw this person, I saw more like a spiritual being than a person that I identified my pain with. You know, it was really just a person who loved me at the end of the day. And yeah. All right. So the box, which is located on the back behind you, I'm not going to ask you to go get it because you just said you were on crutches, you poor thing. Um, <laughs> Where can we find more information about you? And Actually, there's a poster right there. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Um, where can we find more information about you? Um, my website is wendytamisrobbins.com. And Tamis is T-A-M-I-S. So that's my website. There's a lot on there. There's, you know, guided meditations for anxious people who feel like they could never, you know, never meditate, which I felt like for years and years and years. Um, but there's a lot of anxiety resources on there. There's ways to contact me around speaking and coaching as well. You can buy the book there. 
And then on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, it's all Wendy Tamis Robbins. So. Yay. Yay. So Miss Wendy, thank you for bringing us along in your journey. And uh, how long do you have left on crutches? I remember crutches and oh, oh my God. It's brutal. It's worse than I had remembered. Yeah, um, 12 weeks. I had my ankle re um, sewn together because I broke it on soccer and twice. <laughs> oh, God. That's brutal. I, I, yeah, I feel you on this. Yeah, if everything goes well next week, I'll be off after six weeks. Oh, good. Good, good. Yeah. So healing's going well. Yeah, it is going really well, actually. So how many weeks fingers crossed. Physical therapy. Um, I've only been three times, but we've started stairs and I'm walking with one crutch there. So yeah, so we, I go twice a week. Yeah. So see what happens. Even in surgery, she's determined to succeed. And that's <laughs> Wendy, thank you so much for joining us today and keep me posted directly. Um, as to your next book, I would love to be able to share that with people. It's, it's really important because there's so many people with anxiety issues and, and we can't overcome them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's Bye, Miss Wendy. Take care. Bye. You, you too. You're watching Living and Thriving with Rusty. I'm Rusty and I get to do this. I get to do this like a bazillion times a day and it is so cool and so fun. And I get to share these amazing, beautiful people with you and they get to talk to you unfiltered, unattached and through the end of their storm. And what I hope is that it changes your perspective, it challenges your narrative, and it gets you excited about what's going to happen around the corner because it's just one more step that you need to take and you can get through it. Trust me, I've gone through hell and back and I still smoke a cigar once a year celebrating my birthday. Um, enjoy life and do something kind for people. We have so much negativity out there and it's just not worth it. Go buy a cup of coffee or buy a family a breakfast or something. You don't need to Facebook it. It doesn't need to be paparazzi. Um, just know that you're doing good in this world. And in turn, other people will do good. And maybe this world will just be anxiety free. That would be kind of nice. Know that you're loved. Know that you're beautiful. And until next time.